Welcome to the Entrepreneur Showcase. I'm Julie Terry, Professor of Graphic Design here at Mount West Community and Technical College. We're very excited to see everyone here today. Mount West wants all of you to be successful in your lives and your careers. You are the next generation of leaders in your communities. Mount West wants to help you gain the education, skills, and confidence to follow your dreams and make them come true. We hope you will hear or feel something today that will make a positive impact on your life. Before we start, we have a few housekeeping items. Please turn off or set your phones on silent so that we don't disturb our speakers. Second, if you cannot stay for the entire program, please uh, step out and leave quietly when you do so. If you need to leave for a moment for a quick break or to check a message, please do so quietly and then return. Our program will conclude at 2 p.m. today. Third, please limit, limit, limit the conversations with your friends and checking your phones. Give your full attention and respect to the speakers today. Fourth, all of you should have received an entrepreneur mindset handout and a survey. If not, please raise your hand and we'll bring one to you. On the back of the handout are eight entrepreneurial principles and a comparison between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. These eight standards have proven time and again to lead people to success, whether in their own business or as a valued high-performing employee. Entrepreneur is a big word with a lot of letters and it's kind of hard to spell. But boiled down, an entrepreneur is a person who sees opportunities where others do not who finds a way to provide a valuable product or service to customers to fulfill an unmet need or to provide something better than what's currently available. Entrepreneurs can work within an existing organization or they can create their own new businesses. And you do, don't have to be a finance or business major to be an entrepreneur. You just need to have a compelling idea that you take action on, and that's the word, action. It's no good if it's just up in your head. You must take action. As you listen to our guests, consider how the eight principles of the growth mindset may have played a part in their successes. As you watch the presentations, mark your answers on the survey, and please return your survey at the end of the program. After the speakers each answer the three questions that I will pose to them, we will open the floor to questions. I'm very proud to introduce our panel of entrepreneurs now. Your handout has a little short bio about each, but they will tell more about themselves in the upcoming program. All three are highly successful, well-respected business people who work in the creative industry. Our guests are all local, educated locally, and they work based in this region. We have Alicia Meadows Byland, owner of Lucky Cat Design Company, David Wirtz, CEO of Infinity Marketing Solutions. We have Bo Smith, the mind behind the Winona Earp comic book series and television show. Let's give them a warm wel welcome. I feel warm already. <laughs> it is. Thank you. <laughs> It is warm in here. In anticipation of that 4.6 meteor budget cut, we cut on the air. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have three main questions for our guests, and each will have time to answer the question and pass the microphone down the line to the next. And then in the remaining time that we have, we will open the floor to your questions. So we will start with the question of... Tell us what your, com what your company is currently doing. You can show us and tell us about what you are currently doing. Do I need to hold this or is it okay if it's on the table? I do. <laughs> okay. I can hold it for you if you need. It's okay. Um, as Julie said, my name is Alicia. Um, I own Lucky Cat Design Company. And currently what's going on with Lucky Cat is um, we just opened our second store here in Huntington, West Virginia. Um, my first store is located in Galplis, Ohio, which is where I'm from. Um, so um, this second store was a huge step for me. And um, 
we are settling into Huntington. Um, it is different being out of the area that I'm used to. Um, when I opened my store in Galpolis, I was selling, um, I had been selling t-shirts for two years. So coming into Huntington where a lot of people don't know me, um, learning some um, things that are different in what Huntington people like versus what Galpolis people like. Um, but just to show you where we're currently at, the best way to see what Lucky Cat's doing is on social media. Um, we post every day on Facebook and Instagram, and um, you'll just see here some of our current t-shirts, um, the one I'm wearing today and this one right here. A little bit about Lucky Cat is we do a thing, um, a bigger word for what we do would be vertical in integration, but we're not really that big of a business, but I share my space with a plant store. <laughs> um, so we're two separate businesses, but we do share space in Galplis and we also share our space in Huntington. So that what that does is basically help me with rent and expenses by being able to split that with another business. Um, so this shirt was uh, what we did for our one year anniversary, um, kind of bringing both stores together. Um, Lucky Cat is named after the Lucky Cat, the little cat that waves. So, um, feeling everything but sorry. Um, this is one of our new shirts that's kind of for anyone and everyone, and it's kind of a take on um, don't apologize for yourself and the hashtag sorry not sorry. Um, I find that in today's society, people feel like they need to apologize all the time, and I don't really know what that's about. So. This shirt's about feeling everything but sorry. So we're getting ready to launch a campaign um, this month that we're gonna start telling people stories. One thing that I'm very passionate about is I don't want somebody to come in my store and worry about what they're buying. I don't do political things, I don't do religious things, I don't do anything that's controversial or make somebody feel uncomfortable. Uh, we try to embrace everybody, make everybody feel good. So we're gonna start telling stories about people that are from this region. And when I say this region, I mean Appalachia, the region that uh, we are from and encompasses a big part of Ohio and all of West Virginia. So I have a lot of um, customers and people that follow us on social media that have had, um, submitted their stories to me, uh, whether they be about suicide, drug abuse, um, weight loss, divorce, um, just anything that uh, they have overcame and they feel good about. And part of that is gonna be this feeling everything but sorry motto. Um, one of my other shirts that'll play a role in it is, um, I have a shirt that says she comes from the hills of Appalachia. She is a force to be reckoned with. Um, so it's this diamond shirt right here. Um, so basically that's a little bit about feeling the pressures that we feel here in this region and overcoming those things. So I look forward to sharing those people's stories with everyone and um, kind of introducing myself a little bit more to this area and what I'm about. Um, I find that people come in, they wanna know what everything means. <laughs> um, this Appalachian power plant shirt, um, get a lot of questions about what does that mean? Is that coal power? Is that anti-coal? Is that making fun? Is that, it's none of those things. Um, where I grew up, I drove by these power plants. Uh, it's the Gavin plant, the Kiger Creek plant. They sit on the Ohio River. I drove by them almost every day in my life for probably over, well, I'm 43. So I'm, for 40 years, I drove by those plants on a regular basis. Um, power plants are something we see every day. They're part of the landscape. So that was my take on it. Now, if you want to wear a shirt and you think that means coal power, then that's up to you. But <laughs> I do get that a lot is what, what does that mean? Um, most of my shirts are community based. Um, right now in Huntington, obviously everyone loves Marshall. Um, I don't have a license from Marshall, so I have to do green and white stuff. So <laughs> um, that's where we're at right now. And Galplis, I do a lot of our local schools um, because we're a small community and we only have four. Um, this area branches out quite a bit farther, so we haven't really got into that yet. Um, but that gives you kind of a good idea um, some of our uh, Huntington shirts we did around the 4th of July. We're located in the Progress Building. It's actually on 8th Street between uh, 4th and 5th. We're right by the city building and across from the courthouse. Um, the Progress Building's a new 
newly remodeled building and um, there's some another small business River City Leather in there that's also from Galplus and there's a new boutique getting ready to open um, also the building on the corner from us that's on the corner of um, 4th Avenue and 8th Street it's going under a remodel I'm told it's by the same person that owns the building that the market is in so we're really looking forward to that and it's uh, helping re revitalize Huntington. Did you have did you have a question? Where was it that you just said? We are located on 8th Street between 4th and 5th. Yeah. So right on the corner um, at 4th and 8th is a large building that I'm told is uh, being re renovated by the same person that did the market. So that gives you a little idea and um, on Instagram, we're lucky cat underscore design co. So we're pretty easy to find. And uh, I think that's. So you're on Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yes. Usually I just share Instagram to Facebook because I know we'll talk about that later, but that's one challenge when you're one person is um, social media. It's so important right now. And it's the best way to get advertising out. And the, the good thing about it is it's free, but keeping up with it is a whole nother ball game and with having two locations now I find the easiest way is I focus on Instagram and share everything from Instagram to Facebook. Thank you. Uh, hey guys, my name is Dave, uh, owner and CEO of Infinity Marketing Solutions and what we're doing right now is um, I can't believe that we're doing this, but we're gearing up for the political cycle of 2020. Uh, so in addition to helping businesses with their marketing endeavors, we also help uh, political candidates as well. Uh, one of the issues that we recognize when we set out to actually start this business is that um, a lot of people struggle with technology and really what that means and utilizing it to its, um, you know, instead of it being a hindrance, it should help you further their goals. So businesses struggle with it, um, individuals struggle with it, but political candidates, uh, especially in West Virginia, struggle with it quite a bit. So I don't mean just making a website and don't mean just sending some emails. I mean actually using the data behind to um, actually get their message in front of the people who will donate, who will vote. Maybe maybe they're on the fence about voting. Um, and so what we do um, is we help people, we, even down, uh, we're actually running, uh, helping a city council race here in the city of Huntington. Uh, we're doing some delegate, uh, House of Delegates races here in West Virginia as well, and also some statewide races. Uh, we work with Bob Beach, uh, running for agricultural commissioner. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, what we do is we help them establish small dollar donor programs. So uh, in this day and age, you know, there's kind of two types of candidates. I'm not trying to get political right now, but uh, it's either big money or small money, right? Um, and so I'm very passionate about getting as much money out of politics as possible. Uh, I think there's way too much there. Um, and so what we try to do is help candidates set up a successful smaller donor program um, so that way they don't have to be reliant on, you know, big oil money, big farmer money, whatever it happens to be. Uh, trying to get people, um, you know, accountable to the people they represent versus the businesses that just uh, happen to cut a couple big checks for them. So what we're doing to gear up for that, uh, we actually are making a scalable digital product. So what we do typically for a business, if they want to do, say, digital ads or run a, an ad campaign, <clears throat> that takes a lot of time. you got to work with them to develop the message, develop the creative content, develop the targeting, uh, and all these different platforms and things. But that's, it's so much work that it's not really scalable for us. And so what that means is uh, I'm the bottleneck immediately. So um, we need to help more people. We need to raise more money. We need to be that a, we need that to be a scalable digital product. Um, so we're working on some of that stuff to kind of reduce the overhead and just the, the human time, the fingers on keyboard time uh, needed to do that kind of stuff. So that's really fun. Uh, we're going to really spend some money, uh, money on hardware, on video cameras. Uh, we're trying to set up a mobile video studio to where we can just turn our audio video guy loose anywhere in the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. To either do a uh, let's say a live video, which uh, has really good engagement across the board, uh, really picking up, or even you know record some B-roll or something for some shots later. Uh, in fact, just the other day we went to um, I forget what the actual location's called, but it's where they distribute all the food for the students in West Virginia. There were 12 food tr uh, semi trucks sitting there with food in it that should have been distributed a while back. Uh, kind of like a little bit of investigative journalism. We took our drone up, flew around, got some footage, and that candidate now is going to use that. Um, to kind of talk about um, distribution of food to the kids who need it most in West Virginia, because it's currently not happening. 
Uh, so it's some, some interesting stuff we're trying to do. You know, um, we set out to help businesses use technology. Um, in fact, our mission and, and vision statement is to use data-driven technology to be an economic driver for us in his future. Um, and so what we're doing right now, you know, we have a full plate of business clients right now, but we're getting ready to pick up even more political clients. So it's going to be a big growth phase for us. Uh, a little bit scary, a little bit terrifying. Uh, I actually served as Richard Ojeda's IT digital marketing director for his 2018 congressional race. Love him or hate him, the guy rattled a lot of cages, raised a lot of money. We were part of the team to help him do that. Um, and I know just how much work that took for just one race. So we're trying to do a lot more races this time. Uh, so I can feel more of my hair falling out and everything else too, to uh, kind of get ready for that. That's part of my prep uh, too, but um, we're, we're gearing up for that in a big way. My name's Bo Smith. Um, I make stuff up for a living. That's what I do. Uh, I was a journalism major in college and found out that that was not for me for the simple fact they wanted facts and I wanted fiction. So I transferred that to kind of creative writing. Um, I have written for the last 32 years comic books. Uh, television and video games. Uh, each one of them, comic books is what I set out to do as a goal because I wanted to do that since I was a kid, since I was four years old. Just had to find a way of doing it. The others I stumbled into because of comics. So it, it wasn't a, a huge mission plan. It, when it comes up, Julie, it'll be the video if, if we get that far. <laughs> um, I'm going to need, uh, I hate to abandon this, I'm going to need somebody's help here. Chase, pardon me for just a second. If you could, these are one of our poker cards that we manufacture in merchandise. I've already signed one side, and I'm going to have Chase hand those out to everybody. This, I, I, you know, this is like civics class when I was in school. Y you know, you want to have something that that's fun so hopefully this will be fun and we'll get get that taken care of but guys I got I, I've got diarrhea of the mouth so I talk I talk quite a bit and yep we're, this will tell you about the TV show why on earth it's just a real quick video with the cast and crew and I'll let that do the talking there it's been on television now we're starting our fourth season in January, we go into production in Calgary, Alberta. Um, but it's something I created in fourth grade. Uh, I used to, and this is a long time ago, when I was a kid, westerns and monsters littered the, the landscape of pop culture. So I used to write stories in my notebook instead of doing math of Wyatt Earp and his, his brothers fighting the universal monsters, Frankenstein, Wolfman, Dracula, that kind of thing. Um, and it's something I never let go of. Uh, when I got into comics, oh gosh, like I said, 32 years later, this was something that I, I was always drawn to. I was drawn to comic books, words and pictures, even in the fourth grade when I could not read. And it was just, it told a story. And those stories, the reason I related to it, because those stories were in my head. That's the way I've always seen telling a story was in static pictures, not so much... Uh, film, a television, but in my head they were always in pictures and they were always connected. So this was something I was, I'm not comparing myself by any stretch of the imagination to say Michael Jordan or Wayne Gretzky, but it had to be the same feeling they had the first time they touched a ball or a hockey stick or a puck. It, it's just something I've been drawn to all my life. And I had normal life here, you know, all 64 years living in West Virginia and Huntington, and normal life, went to school, you know, had a lot of dead-end jobs, and by dead-end, I'm not uh, getting on the places I worked, it's just you could only go so far, and that would be it, and uh, I sold, you know, this is again the old days, I sold records, I sold, I worked in a sporting goods department, um, I worked in audio video back when there were eight tracks and stuff. I did all that, but I knew it could only go so far. And comic books and storytelling was something that I always wanted to do. But back then, you had to live in New York City to get that done. And, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a town of maybe 50,000. How am I going to get that done? And back then, there was no Internet. So communication was a bit of a problem. 
So what I did, each comic book had a letter column that fans would write and readers would write letters into. So if I bought six comic books that week, I sat home and wrote six letters to the assistant editor and the editor because I knew, not to the writer, not to the artist, because I thought to myself, if I want to do a story, those aren't the guys that are going to be able to hire me. They're going to be the guys going, oh, you want my job? Forget it. You know, that kind of a thing. So I wrote to the editors, and I did this every week. And in these letters, it was kind of nice because I did not have to do that face-to-face -face at that time being a semi-shy kid, you know, at, at 12 years old. I did not have to do it face-to-face. -face. So the letters, I could be creative. I could be a little bit funny, well, what I thought was funny, as my wife always says, what's funny in here doesn't come out funny on my mouth. But it, it, it worked in the fact that I did it for so long. I ended up having probably over span of four years, I had 300 letters printed in each comic. And I always, how can I set myself apart from John Edwards, from Bill Taylor? So I signed all four of my names, Stephen, Scott, Bo, Smith. So even that little bit of difference was going to make a difference. And sure enough, I, I saved up money and went to a couple of conventions. Uh, we didn't have any around here, so it was actually a matter of saving money up. Went, I sought out these editors that were there, and I'd go, oh, my name's uh, Bo Smith, and first thing I went, you're the guy with four names. I know you. You write me letters all the time, and you know, yeah, yeah, that's me, and built up a relationship, got a little bit of rapport. And it wasn't any time after that, they started writing back to me saying, hey, we've got an advance copy of Batman 141 coming out. We'd like to have a letter column in it. Would you mind reading this Xerox copy of the issue and send us a letter? And first of all, I was thrilled to get an advanced, you know, Xerox copy of Batman. And the second, they wanted that. So my little bit had succeeded. And it wasn't a whole lot, but it was more than Bill Taylor or Johnny Edwards was doing in Iowa or in Florida. And it was something I just, you know, I really felt, felt drawn to telling stories. So I did those in those letters. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to cut it real short. Bottom line is I did get into the business in 1987 through that method. And the other thing that I did at the conventions, I got to know not the artists and writers that were working then, but the artists and writers that were trying to get in, just like me, because I can't draw stick figures. So I had to find an artist to relate myself with, you know, and did. Ended up being lifetime relationships. A lot of these guys I'm still working with today. Um, but that, bottom line is, I still worked here. I did not work there. And at that point... I was, and guys, I was 30, 30 years old then, uh, working a pretty much dead-end job, and just recently divorced, was not living with my son. It was a low point for me, and I'll never forget going out from, that, from work that night, sitting on the tail end of, tailgate of my pickup truck, and I said, this isn't what I want, you know. And to do it, I didn't have, at that point, I didn't have anybody to to give me the secret or here, let me do this for you. So I started in earnest writing letters of, hey, I've got a pitch, you know, for a Batman story, a story of mine, whatever it may be. And it wasn't, it wasn't uh, real easy, but it happened. And luckily enough for me, working from here, when I'd meet these guys at these conventions, the way I talk set me apart from everybody else, everyone else did not have a West Virginia accent. So they, they liked that. They liked the fact you got four names. Okay, that's weird. You talk weird. Maybe you can write weird stories for us. And it did. Um, I've, I've used that to my advantage ever since. I'm not the most gregarious guy in the world, but I had nothing to lose, nothing at all. What's the worst could happen? Just doing what I was continuing to do. So it, was, it gave me the freedom to talk to these people and do it, even though I was nervous, you know, my underarms looked like a river, but I had nothing to lose. I would keep writing stories for myself for my own entertainment regardless. So that's how that part of me progressed. I am still my own business. I work out of my house, my dog on the floor, and my editors, my publishers, they're all over the world. Uh, 
once, twice a year. I go to Calgary on the set for the television thing. We do that every year. We do most of the that, again, by uh, social media, which is, as Alicia was talking, that's huge. That has helped me out unbelievably. I mean, it's, it's, again, I'm talking too much, taking too much time, so we'll go to the next thing. I apologize, gosh. So, Bo, you did answer the next question, which was tell us the story of how you got to where you were, including the ups and downs. More time for them so you've answered the next question, so now Dave can answer that question. If you could pick up the microphone, and thank you so much. If we can bring up anything or help you. Okay. Uh, I think I will actually pull up a video here real quick. Uh, we put this together for, um, you know, I guess the question is, um, how do we got to what we're doing today? Okay. So uh, the thing that I'm the most proud of and the work that we've done here, we've done a lot of really cool things. I can show you my portfolio and all the websites we've built, and that's great and all. Uh, but the biggest thing we've done is quite literally save Blinko glass. Um, do you guys know Blinko? Anybody familiar with Blinko? Okay, cool. So when, uh, when we met Mr. Uh, Six here, Dean Six, uh, wonderful human being, great leader, uh, Blinko was struggling. They filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2008, and they never got their feet back under them. Uh, when we met them, they didn't have the money to pay us what we asked. Uh, they needed a new website. They had over 50,000 unique visitors per month on their website, and their conversion rate was half a percent. Uh, that's abysmal, right? They were literally leaving money on the table. So we're like, Dean, you have to do something different, or else you're never going to, you're not going to recover. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so kind of get a little background information here. Um, so let me just play this video now. Uh, my name is Dean Six, and I'm the Vice President and General Manager at Blinko Glass. At Blinko Glass, we do a number of community programs, um, things that are meant to bring the public to our campus. One of them was a music event, and it turned out that a couple of musicians who were our guests as part of that uh, were members and part of the team at Infinity. That's when we first met them, and invited them to come back talked to us about doing marketing and instantly felt uh, an affinity with Infinity. We'd worked with people in the past to do digital and online marketing, uh, things I'm not even sure about the words for it. But we weren't really satisfied with what we thought the potential could be and the results we were getting. So when we first met and talked with the young men from Infinity, uh, very, very much impressed with their enthusiasm, their obvious knowledge and familiarity with the concepts. They were already excited and telling us things that we might and could do. And they had a pitch about really liking to work with people in their community and building community and working with people as partners, a kind of approach that seemed very much in step with what we would want. So we instantly said, this, this makes good sense to us. Let's see if we can't be you know, in a good working relationship. As a small company and a small community, that whole sense of community is very important. And from our initial conversations with the guys from Infinity, there, there was an instant recognition that we had common values and that we were in. Uh, so let me just pause that right there and kind of talk about how we actually started. So about three years ago, we're three years young. Um, I'm actually only 32. The mean average for people in my company is about 28. Uh, so we're all a bunch of young folks. Um, we started, there were four co-founders, started in the uh, <laughs> back of a lawyer's uh, office. It was a spare room. Remember, the, we had giant post-it notes and everything, trying to figure out exactly what we were trying to do. We didn't know anything other than we were four people who were unhappy with the options presented to us. Uh, and we were going to do something about it. We didn't know what it was, but we were going to do something. Uh, we were going to figure it out before we left that day. And um, I'd actually been, I learned programming since uh, 2002. I remember sitting on my dad's lap, uh, com command prompt type stuff. Um, so it's always been kind of a part of what I like to do. Got into programming, uh, more so into uh, web development. Um, and so I, I had picked up just kind of freelance, a couple website odd jobs here and there. Um, and so what we kind of decided to do was help people use the web, use technology to further their goals. And so 
Um, Blinka was one of our first big clients. Um, and like I said, when we first started working with them, they didn't have a dime to their name. Uh, literally, pennies of the dollar, what we asked for is what we actually wound up taking because it was such a huge opportunity. It, a 125-year-old business, uh, the cornerstone of, of really in Cowell County. Uh, Blinka is world-renowned. You know, we can't pass this opportunity up. Um, so we busted our butts and bent over backwards for Blinko. Um, so what we did the, the, for Blinko, first of all, uh, we rebuilt their e-commerce e system. They were on some awful GoDaddy hosted service type thing. Uh, we took WordPress, I don't know if my developer people in here, web design folks around here, WordPress guys. Okay, so we took WordPress, added WooCommerce to it, built them, because uh, they have kind of a complicated business scenario for how they actually pack glass, and their fulfillment system was, of course, uh, atrocious too. So, you know, we built the website that couldn't handle the amount of sales they were actually getting, so we had to improve their logistics system. Uh, so now they're actually saving over $1,000 a month. Customers are receiving their glass faster. Um, they didn't even have, uh, like, an order notification system system uh, before for Blinko. When you would actually submit your credit card information, it was stored in plain text. So like really, really, really bad stuff. Um, so and the reason we were able to, to do this kind of stuff is because basically I treated it just like Amazon. So I am an ex-Amazon uh, employee. So uh, just right over here on the hill, I'll start at the ground level, answering phone calls, head chained to a desk for 40 hours a week. Um, it was not a whole lot of fun. Uh, however, they do have an incredibly good and infectious culture at Amazon. Uh, you know, they are a massive presence uh, to be Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world for a very good reason. Uh, and that's the leadership culture there that they have. Um, and, and in fact, if you guys were taking notes or anything today, definitely recommend you look up Amazon's leadership tenants. Uh, there's 10 different core principles that they operate by. Uh, and that's what I took, I stole from Amazon and implemented at Infinity, uh, very, very much day one. So that's, uh, at Infinity, if you're looking for uh, a bonus or if it's time for review, wherever it happens to be, I'm going to ask you what you just did the last six or three months based on those leadership tenants and how that impacted our business. Um, so a lot, lots of stuff that we, um, you know, took from Amazon, my time at Amazon, um, to actually get there. So we built Blinko, their own little mini Amazon. So now they actually have the voice of the customer. They actually have feedback mechanisms in place to see if things are arriving on time or if they're happy with it. Um, and beyond that, too, so we, um, you know, they say you sit in Strata, but we've definitely straddled with Blinko to where we're helping their internal processes as well. <clears throat> Um, so they actually now have this official voice of the employee feedback line here. So we're actually tracking and recording and reporting on uh, the employee satisfaction of Blinko because they're trying to attract people. So when we first started, they weren't sure if they're going to be open tomorrow. Today, now they're actually having issues hiring the people to match the demand that we're able to build for them. Uh, so that's really, really, really cool stuff. And that's just drawing from my team's experience, both at Amazon, uh, my operations officer, he's installed every point of sales system in the Tudors and Giovanni's here in the state. Uh, so, you know, we have this kind of unique digital, um, some marketing, but really it's just Blinko needed a leader. They needed somebody to come in to take charge and lead this change both internally and externally at Blinko. Uh, unfortunately, we were they, people able to do that. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, born and raised here, very passionate for this state. Um, I'm here for a reason. I actually moved to Colorado. I met Brad Smith, the CEO of Intuit. Uh, he's a Marshall grad as well, met him at Marshall, he offered me a job, uh, so I graduated, um, moved there like quite later the next day, hated it, hated being away from home, hated being away from West Virginia, uh, so I moved back to put, uh, plant, uh, plant some roots here and, and really help make West Virginia um, a place that we all want to stay and a place that uh, really is worthy of, you know, the, the praise that we give it, so. Sure, uh, I'm stubborn. Uh, to to a fault for sure. Um, the the guys that um, you know when we started this business, actually my operations officer was just talking about a moment ago. He was going to join the military. So quite literally on Friday, I begged and pleaded him, please come s s help me start this thing. If it fails, you can join the military later. They'll be right there waiting on you. Um, he was going to go sign paperwork that Monday. Uh, so it was so close to where we actually started. And so what we did, we got uh, him and two other folks that we happened to know at the time that had some experience in marketing. Um, and we didn't have a dime to our names, a bunch of kind of broke post-college guys, right, meandering around in the world trying to figure out what we're doing. Uh, but we took $500, we registered the business, we got business cards, and we registered our domain, our infinitymarketing.com. Uh, so with that, we were lethal, and we hit the ground running. Um, so quite literally, you know, if you're just unhappy and you've got a mission and you want to do something, you can do it. 
Um, you don't even have to buy a domain. You don't have to buy business cards, and you can get your uh, LLC registration for free if you're under 30 through the state. So quite literally, you can start a job for free with nothing. Um, you know, business cards are 20 bucks. So you can start with the change that's rattling around in your car uh, to go down and start knocking some doors and make some stuff happen. Uh, Bo just said, you write letters every single week, the, the tenacity that it takes to do that. Um, it, it's, it's real. Um, you got to do it. But it's easy to do if you're passionate about it. And it just feels like this is what you're supposed to be doing. So it doesn't feel like work. It just feels like destiny. And you're just trying to, trying to, uh, trying to get there. So, answer your question. Something these three people have mentioned in different words that is a big part of the Eli training that that uh, Miss Terry has included on the flyer, the mindset lessons. A big part of Eli is go before you know. They call it effectual reasoning, but it is you know just taking that leap of faith, taking your foot off third base, and running for home and and doing something, just like David said, if you've got a passion for it, do it before you really know what you need to do. It's easy to pivot and change later. Um, you can always refine and, and redo what you set out to do. Uh, but ultimately, the, the bias for action is what you need. Just try it, get it, try it, get it going. So that answers one of the questions on the survey because one of the questions asked, do you need a detailed marketing and business plan in order to move forward with a, a business? So I think they've just answered that question. I still don't have a business plan. Probably shouldn't say that, but I don't. So. Okay. Alicia will continue telling her story yeah. about how she got to where she is today. I'll try to keep this quick and not boring, but one thing that's important to me when I come back here is that... I graduated from here in May of 2016. So it's just now 2019. And I just opened my second store, so I want you guys to realize how possible that is. And I also started with nothing. And I still don't have a loan from a bank. Um, so how I started Lucky Cat was just with the goal of, I've, this may sound silly, but I've loved t-shirts my whole life. Every time we ever went anywhere, uh, if we traveled, if we went to a concert, if we went to something in our hometown or whatever, I just felt like I had to have a t-shirt, had to wear it, just love t-shirts. I'm very casual. But anyways, um, I also learned that I like to do advertising and marketing, and I found myself in a few jobs where I didn't have the skills to get to the point that I wanted to, and I could get to that point, but it might take me several hours longer than what it would take somebody who actually knew what they were doing and had the skill set. So at 38 years old, I found myself here um, after being a hairstylist for um, 10 years. So anyway, after when I, while I was here in school, I got a job in graphic design making digital billboards, and um, the whole time I'm at work, I just keep talking about t-shirts, talking about t-shirts. But you know, things are hard. You're in school, you got a job, some of you might be in school, have jobs and families, and just life is hard. So I had an opportunity to do a pop-up shop um, in our local movie theater. And so basically, I sold uh, my first round of t-shirts uh, to this movie theater at wholesale price. And um, they sold them for retail, and that's how we, we kind of worked that out. Um, it opened up in November of 2016, and we closed it in January of 2018. Um, and then it wasn't very long until I could actually um, open my own store in Galpolis, um, which is this uh, top left-hand picture here. That's our storefront. And then the second picture is our storefront here in Huntington. They both have a very similar vibe inside. We're kind of industrial and the focus is the products on my side of the store. Um, I have not wanted to get a loan from a bank because that's a lot of pressure. Um, you take rent and employees and all the bills that come with owning a store and then you put a big loan on top of that, which a lot of people will do to be able to buy inventory and to have a safety net for a while but I'm just kind of flying by the seat of my pants and I feel a little bit better that way. <laughs> um, I have loved small business my whole life. Um, my father owned a hometown pharmacy, which 
You don't see many of those around anymore. I started working there when I was 13 years old. Um, I loved his communication with people. I loved that people came there because they knew him and they felt comfortable. Uh, they knew where their money was going. Those are some of the reasons that uh, small business sticks out to me. I also loved it that he was his own boss. I'm like my neighbor here. I'm stubborn. I don't like to be bossed around. I don't like to work for people. I just, that's just me being honest. Um, I like to work with people. I don't like to work for people <laughs> unless it's community. Um, that's my other big thing is community involvement. I put a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of free projects back into our community. I'm not doing it in Huntington yet, but I'm on the tipping point of that to get involved because our communities around here need need positive, uh, uplifting, and um, just a sense of pride. We need to get back around here. Um, so I do spend a lot of time and giving back to my community. Um, my goal is to empower others like you all and, and other people in the community to show you that you can do whatever you want to do. It doesn't have to be on a huge scale. I'm perfectly happy with um, my two small stores. I mean, granted, I would love for it to get bigger at some point in time, but um, you know, right now it, it makes me happy and I'm able to do what I like to do. Some of the problems that I deal with are not really necessarily problems. They're just the cold facts of owning a business that you don't always think about. It's rent, payroll. I've got four employees. Um, I've got two for each store, plus myself. Uh, utilities, insurance, taxes. That's uh, income taxes, payroll taxes, all the city fees and fun stuff. Huntington has a lot. Um, Inventory. Um, I struggle with inventory because inventory that's setting to me is money that is setting. So I try trying really hard to learn that over the last few years about um, how not to have a lot of money setting on my shelf. So I want them to come in and fly out the door. Um, marketing. I try to do as much free marketing as I can with social media. It's um, social media is a blessing and a curse. A lot of people are using it for the wrong things, but I always try to stay positive, keep people informed, and keep it brief. Um, social media is shoving things down our throat on a daily that we don't need. Um, so I try to be very aware of that with my business. And I also don't link my business page. They're linked because you have to on Facebook. But I don't link my personal business, what goes on in my personal life, with my business. I keep that very separate. Um, other things that cost money are subscriptions to like uh, Adobe Creative Suite. I use the Square um, point of sale in my stores. That costs money. I use QuickBooks. That costs money. <laughs> so there are always uh, monthly subscriptions that I pay out to. And then charity. Um, I try to give back to the community and to the local schools and anything that I feel is uh, for a good cause. Oh, I went backwards. Um, this is my claim, claim to fame, the only one I've had so far on national television was uh, one of my shirts was on Teen Mom 2 on MTV and I got really super excited. Uh, I know that's kind of crazy, but Corey there is from West Virginia and uh, he picked up my shirt in Point Pleasant at a store that I sell a few t-shirts on and you don't know how excited I got when people started texting me saying, I just saw your shirt on MTV. So that's my uh, little tiny claim to fame. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, our, our latest uh, thing is getting in here to Huntington, and um, it's, it's tough, um, but we're going to keep going, and I'm going to keep getting out and meeting people and talking about what I do, and um, hopefully that small business that is growing in America, again, not just here, but in small towns all across this nation, people want to know where their money's going. They don't want to give it to people that are doing things that they don't believe in with it or um, wasting it or not investing it back into your community. When you buy a t-shirt at one of my stores, um, I have given back to several employees. I've given back to people that helped me make my t-shirts. I've um, given the money right back to where it started and that's very important to me. So as much as I've helped revitalize the downtown Galpolis area, I hope to continue that here in Huntington. And um, that's just you know, you can find all this easy. We have a website. It's luckycatdesigncode.com. Um, it's very brief right now. I don't really do online sales. Um, people can shop us by emailing us if they see something on social media that they like. Um, 
but that's where I'm at and hopefully I've covered some of your entrepreneurship questions. <laughs> so Dave, we'll let you start this third round, okay? So for the third round, we would like you to give some of your best advice for students. Okay. okay. I got some real good ones. Um, all right. Two things. Very, very big things. Two books. Uh, number one, Connecting the Dots. Um, oh, my gosh. I just forgot his name. Um, no, it's Cisco CEO. It's, um, oh, my gosh. Anyways, Connecting the Dots. Great book. Uh, it's the, the guy from the CEO of Cisco, Cisco Network. They make routers, all the different uh, things around here. I'm sure we're actually getting hit with Wi-Fi beams from Cisco devices right now, um, from West Virginia. And the book is incredibly good. It's, it's kind of a hometown thing of how he grew up and um, uses these West Virginia, um, you know, just the, the things that make us Appalachians. And he applies that to being a leader at Cisco um, to be, to future-proof yourself um, and to recognize disruption in your own industry so you don't get disrupted. Incredibly, uh, really, really, really good book. And the next book is The E-Myth Revisited. Um, it's a book about how, just because the e-myth, like email, e-myth, yep, uh, revisited. It's uh, the revised version. And that book, um, it hit me really hard because it talks about how, you know, just because a web designer stepped up to start a business doesn't necessarily make me an entrepreneur. I'm not necessarily solving any problems. I'm really changing the industry. Um, so it really kind of let me recognize, kind of put me in my place a little bit um, about you know, exactly what I thought I was doing. Um, so connecting the dots, uh, John Chambers is his name, John Chambers, excuse me, um, and The E-Myth Revisited. Both really, really, really good books that helped me out in a major way. Uh, Dean Six from Blinko also read Connecting the Dots, and he's taking some of those principles as well to heart um, to, you know, start to um, recognize trends in the glass industry to help him be uh, kind of future-proof and disruption-proof. Um, the two remaining things here, number one, uh, the kind of old-fashioned cliches that have kind of stood the test of time, like don't hire your friends, um, some things like that, like th those are real. Listen to them. Uh, they're, they've not, you know, uh, withstood the test of time because they're just kind of fun things to say. They are very real. We've, I've ran into a lot of personal and professional issues as a result of that. I thought, nope, that won't bother me. That won't impact me. I was wrong. Um, very, very wrong about that in a lot of ways. Um, and another thing is, too, get used to asking for help. Um, I grew up on Tricky Creek, corn fed from the hills, you know, <laughs> uh, you don't ask for help. It's not what we do. You either do it yourself or you don't do it. Um, you have to get comfortable asking for help, asking for help from lawyers, from accountants, from other people who've been in your industry. Um, it, it's okay to ask for help um, and you better get good at it now so you can do it uh, later on. So those are my four things. Thank you. And then I'll just comment too that for those of you, I think everyone in this room has heard Jamie Bain, our librarian, speak to you and tell you about resources and about getting a card to the Cabell County Library and all of its branches that are all connected so that you could access these books that Dave mentioned for free. You could look at the e-versions. You might even see if our library can access them for you. So it's not that you have to buy it or you could probably easily get it from our local libraries. Okay, Bo, so you have some pieces of advice. Well, Julie just brought up a good point. Um, I've also been the vice president of marketing for most of the, for Eclipse Comics, Todd McFarlane Productions, Image Comics, uh, IDW Comics, uh, and June Planning. And how I got those jobs was I had a passion to do comics and do storytelling but I also knew I had to pay the bills every month. So I needed to get paid to do what I loved, so I found that way, and that's for working for those publishers. So at the same time, you're, you're doing a skill, which I learned marketing 30-some 30, 30 years ago, and have been doing it ever since, but at the same time, I'm already in the door. Um, one of the best things that I talked to in uh, middle school 15 years ago, it was you know similar to this, only... For, for that grade. And I told him, I said, find out what you love to do, then find out a way to get paid to do it. And sure enough, 15 years later, uh, we were at the mall, at the Huntington Mall, and I ran into a young man who came up. He goes, he goes, oh, excuse me. He goes, I'm, you know, he told me his name. He goes, uh, he goes, I just want to tell you, he goes, when you talk to our class at Buffalo, he goes, I did what you said. And I said, 
you did? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I'm the equipment manager for the Diamondbacks AAA team in uh, uh, Nashville, I believe it was. Phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's where the, yeah, the AAA was in there. And he said, it, he goes, I knew by the time, he goes, because when you did that class, he goes, I, wanted, I told you I wanted to be a professional pitcher. He goes, well, high school, I knew I wasn't going to be a professional pitcher, but I still love baseball. So I found a way to stay in baseball and, and get paid for it. So uh, my suggestion is there is find something you love to do, get paid for it, and listen to your passion. If you've got a passion for something, then you, if you really want it, and, and you, uh, the old thing, work hard and stuff, there are corners you can cut. There are people that you can meet. Every, every relationship that you have and make can turn into something. So I can't stress those, those two enough. They're, they, I know it sounds pretty blue collar, but they work. And relationships with people uh, is just huge. And that doesn't matter if you're here, you're in New York, you're in Idaho. Relationships make a difference. Um, and if you really want uh, a blue-collar look at marketing yourself, not, not a certain business, right? um, 15 years ago I wrote a marketing book, No Guts, No Glory, How to Market Yourself in Comics. It, it's out of print. It could be anywhere. You may find it in eBay to four for a dollar box, or you may find it in the library as well, which West Virginia did carry it. So if you, it's dated now because, you know, technology has changed, but the, the basics are there, and it's how to market yourself because you are a product. I mean, creative people would just soon write and draw in a room by themselves and not be bothered with anybody else. But in these times, you've got to know how to market yourself some. You really do. And I don't care what anybody says. If you've got an ounce of creativity, you need to share that with somebody because there's somebody that's going to benefit from that, be entertained from it, learn from it, do the same. Everybody's got something to offer. I mean, a lot of people say, well, I don't, I'm socially awkward when I talk to a lot of people. I'm, I should be having adult diapers on right now. I mean, you know, I could have wet myself an hour ago and we don't know it. But it, it's... Don't let those nerves stop you from doing what you want. You, again, you've got nothing to lose a lot of times. That, that should be the attitude. It's not a defeatist attitude. It's a freewheeling, full throttle attitude. You've got nothing to lose. Give it a shot. Um, my best advice is number one, while you're in school, take advantage of the resources that you have, which I think they touched on that. Um, don't say no. Um, if you get offered some projects, even if they're free, um, I did a lot of that and I'm still doing it. Um, and some of them I get paid for now. I've done a lot of work with our local library and it's taught me a lot. Sometimes it gives you an opportunity to work with um, bigger marketing agencies and tell you what works and what doesn't work. Um, do a lot of research. Um, I get a lot of people that look at what I do and say, oh, that's easy, I'm gonna do it too. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to research. You need to research, um, you know, you don't have to have this big detailed business plan, but you need to know what you're up against. You need to research what your competition does, what you might wanna do differently. You need to research, um, they're, like for me, I have a lot of distributors that I get different t-shirts from. It just really depends on what I want to sell at the time. Um, you need to research, um, you know, what, what market you're in, who your target audience is, what they like, what they don't like, like what I was talking about with the differences in Gallia County and, and Huntington. Um, you can do all that now with the internet. Um, it's amazing what free tools you have. Um, I have some of my employees when they're bored, I have them research other t-shirt companies that I feel are similar to ours to see what their prices are, to see where they're at right now, what their marketing looks like. Um, because our world is ever changing. Um, we're a little bit behind here in this area, but we're, social media is kind of pushing all of us to keep up. Um, so, you know, you have to stay relevant if you're going to start a business and keep it going. You have to keep up with what everybody else is doing and all the new people that are coming in. That was true when I did hair. It's just as true 
with selling t-shirts. Um, the other thing is, is you have to do these things if you're going to be an entrepreneur and get down and do it. It's like what both of these guys were saying is you got to know what your why is and don't, you know, get in there, <laughs> get down in it and re really get your hands dirty, so to speak, and don't let people tell you what you should do. It's okay to get people's advice, but it's like me, there's been times where, you know, if we have a, a couple slow days, uh, people will start, they love to do this. Well, you should do this. Well, you should do that. In Huntington, you can't believe how many people in Galpolis say, well, just sell Marshall t-shirts. Well, I can't. <laughs> I mean, I can, illegally, <laughs> um, and I could make one of the biggest uh, entities in Huntington real mad real fast. Um, I'm not going to do that. So, you know, everybody's always quick to tell you what they think you should do. Um, you have to stay true to yourself and what that vision was, um, especially if you get that spark in the beginning that you're like, okay, yes, somebody is buying what I'm selling. I'm going to run with it, and I'm going to keep doing that thing that people love, and I'm going to compete with my competition, and I'm going to keep trying to, trying to do better. You don't, you don't let people keep pulling you back and pulling you back because they will, I promise you. Some, some people that I've thought were some of my biggest supporters have turned out to be some of my biggest enemies, and that's hard. So just stay true to yourself, research, 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 and... Don't say no in the beginning. Take opportunities that are given to you and try things that you wouldn't normally do. Try it while you're in school, and then you can say, I'm in school. I didn't know. I learned from it. Or I'm in school, and I'm really awesome because I just did this, and I haven't even graduated yet, <laughs> you know? So that's my best advice. So how did you um, make the leap from being employed and having a steady paycheck to knowing that you would go into your own business and you started out of your home before you even opened the storefronts? Mm -hmm. um, well, I was lucky. The business that I was working for, they also owned that movie theater that I opened the pop-up shop in and they also did a lot of community events that I was able to become involved with. Um, one thing is when I took the job, and I decided to quit doing hair while I was in school and start this job doing billboards. Billboards wasn't really what I saw myself doing when I went into graphic design. <clears throat> but the bottom line is, if you want to actually get a full-time job in graphic design, you might have to take a job that's not necessarily your passion right off the bat. So I just used those billboard skills and sometimes I'd try to push customers um, <laughs> with things that I thought were creative that maybe they didn't like. And I, I just kept working on my own skills while I was at work. And my boss got so tired of hearing me talk about t-shirts that he basically just said, well, let, let's just try it. So he let me try it at um, an event in our town called the Hoop Project, where my mom and I literally stayed up for 48 hours heat pressing vinyl cut shirts on a silhouette and a cheap heat press. So... <laughs> That was probably the hardest 48 hours I think I've ever worked, and my legs hurt so bad I couldn't hardly stand up to sell T-shirts at the Hoop Project. But um, I sold them. I sold every T-shirt we made, and he saw that people liked them. They liked my ideas. And so um, when the space came available in the movie theater that used to be video and arcade games, he said, what do you think about trying um, a pop-up shop? And I said, well you know, that's fine. And we worked out the details because, um, back to what David was saying, it, it's hard to be partners with people. It's hard to work with friends. And we, we had became friends and I didn't really want to give them my business idea, but I also didn't want to turn the opportunity away. So we came up with the, I'm going to sell you my branded t-shirts. This is my company. I'm going to sell you these t-shirts at wholesale. That allowed me not to have to borrow money. And then he sold them at retail, and it, it took off. It all happened pretty quick. I mean, we're talking from the Hoop Project was in July. We opened the pop-up shop in November. So yeah. I just had to see if people would buy what I was selling. And they did, and then they gave me that opportunity. And the first two, I also said, I want to sell T-shirts in a movie theater. And his proposal to me was, I know it's not what you want, but there's... 600 to 1,000 people through the door every week that's going to see your T-shirts. So I said, okay. So I took some of those chances that weren't really 
ideal to me at the time. Okay, so has everyone answered the last question about advice, I believe? Okay, so we can open the floor to questions now, and we will ask you to speak into the microphone. Um, I'm a huge comic book reader, uh, and... Uh, Thank you for putting biscuits on my table. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, I actually have your uh, Comicsology page up, Oh, and uh, I see uh, your latest project was in, uh, from what I can find, in 2013. Uh, no, latest was last week. It was a new graphic novel, Winona Earp, Bad Day at Black Rock. It's, uh, yep. co uh, I don't know if how much Comicsology has of my latest stuff, but I'm doing, I work every month. So. Yeah, it, it's not in order, so I was kind yeah. of hunt, okay. hunting and looking. Um, but my question is, uh, with... Obviously, how um, long you've been in the industry, what do you feel the biggest changes uh, overall in comics? Um, on the business end, it's been distribution. When I got into comics, we had 27 different distributors. And now that it's just Diamond. Yep, yeah, that were distributed all across the country and out. And each one of those distributors had a minimum of anywhere from 27 to 5 warehouses. Now we have Diamond, one Bang. In fact, when I worked for Image Comics, I uh, was their VP of marketing. Part of what uh, me and the publisher had to do when we went exclusive. It, it, every Marvel had bought a distributor and thought they were going to do it that way. That was a huge, huge hit to the business. So then it got all the remaining distributors vying for the business of all the retailers. And even though it was the best move for us at Image Comics, we were the third largest publisher to sign an exclusive with Diamond. When we left that meeting at the same time, it was the best thing we could do for the company, but we knew in some aspects it was the worst thing we could do for comics. But we had no choice at that, at that point. And uh, that was, a, that was an historically in the business of comic book publishing, that was, that was a moment. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Triplett, you had a question earlier. Let me bring the mic over to you. Okay, so I'm Ted Triplett. I, I teach the engineering design program here. And um, one thing I tell you, you know, the way I, I teach is we are always working on projects, real stuff that come from the students. So what, you know, what idea do you have for a product, that sort of thing. And I also teach an entrepreneurship class in it, which is not easy or particularly fun for me, you know. But so let me ask you some questions I've run into. Did you get any help from any organizations, like uh, setting up your business, um, like SCORE, have you heard of SCORE, something like that? Um, I did receive some help from, we have a, um, organization in Galplis called the Downtown Revitalization Project, and it encompasses two uh, blocks on 2nd Avenue in Galplis. Um, they give um, kind of startup money to businesses. Um, unfortunately for myself, when I started my business, they were pretty depleted of funds, um, and we were two businesses going into one space. Um, I asked for $7,000, and I got $2,000. Um, I took that $2,000 and made all the fixtures. I didn't make them, my husband did, but <laughs> I designed them and my husband made them. Uh, he made our, um, our sales counter and all my hanging racks and um, I paid my first month's rent and utility deposits with that $2,000. Um, how they work now is um, if any new businesses do come into Galplist, you have to present to them your plan and your vision. It wasn't as detailed as what it would be for, um, like say a bank or an investor, but we did have to present a small business plan to them and what our goal was. And then they, in the past, they had had some other businesses that they had actually paid a year's rent for or um, bought like kitchen equipment or something major that the business couldn't afford right off the bat. But as I said, when it got to our turn, we, we were able to get a little bit of money, but it wasn't what we originally had asked for. 
So did you start out with all your product? Yes. Just your product? Mm -hmm. I only sell my t-shirts in the mm -hmm. store. Um, I do all the designs for them. I do have a friend screen print them. My shirts are screen printed in Cincinnati. Um, and that was because I actually went to to that facility to learn how to screen print. Because in the beginning, I was going to do it myself. And when I found what the investment would be uh, for what I wanted to do, and I talked, spent a lot of time talking with them, um, we decided that the best way for me to try to do everything myself was to contract out the screen printing. So that's what I do with that. You guys get any help from anybody? Christy, I'm thinking about you, sir. Works. Um, no, but I wish I would have. Honestly, um, so when we started, the the most help we got, um, we got the LLC, uh, $130 to actually file the LLC, uh, refunded to us for the Young Entrepreneurship Act, I believe. Um, but we did not seek out any help from the SBDC or any of those types of folks. Um, I imagine you probably would have set us on a straighter path, probably would have made sure we got the business development plan done early on. Um, but um, yeah, hard to tell where we'd be today if I had actually started in the right way. But also, too, um, <clears throat> There, you know, I didn't feel like we really needed that kind of stuff because I just wanted to go and, and run anyway. So, one thing I wanted to share with you, real quick, it's hard to get a lot of help as a small business because we're not really small businesses, we're micro. Um, just a quick uh, little fact thing that's kind of um, it's, it's kind of disheartening, really, because I went to the state of Ohio. I've also checked into female-owned and operated businesses because that's also a thing. But um, in the United States, a small business is classified as having fewer than 500 employees and less than $7.5 million <laughs> um, in receipts. And I promise you, <laughs> I'm not making any money yet. I mean, I make money to pay my bills and, and pay my employees, but... Um, we are what's considered a micro business. So, you know, really to get that, you kind of have to be, um, you have to have more than, I think it's, um, what's it say? More than 25 full-time employees. <laughs> so that makes it kind of hard to get funding. So I know that you kept thinking about comics books your whole life. You thought about t-shirts, t-shirts, t-shirts. What happened with you? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, really, uh, as a kid, I wanted to grow up to be an inventor. Um, I wanted to make things. That's all I wanted to do. Um, it's really big in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, on Otello. He just made stuff. He wasn't an inventor. It's what he was, and that's what I wanted to be. Uh, every day I get to invent things, um, so it's pretty cool. Um, all three of you have talked about a, a passion that you had, that you recognized, and that you ran with. And I would probably say most of the people in this room would say, I think as you said, Bo, I don't have any passion on what you're talking about in my life. Do you have any hints mm -hmm. about how people can discover what it is that they're passionate about? And if you do have some hints that work, we will market them, package them, and make that $7.5 million, Alicia. But I hear so many students say, I don't have any dreams. I'm not passionate about anything. How do you find that? That sounds like just a face-to-face -face thing. Because, I mean, I can remember growing up and giving a teacher or someone that, or an adult, that same answer, someone in an authority position. Oh, I don't have any. I, I don't know. And it was, it's mainly just, that's a two-way street. The teacher, the authoritative figure, the adult is going to have to work up is going to have to work up a relationship with who they're asking that, and they genuinely have to really want to know what your passions, your dreams, and your interests are. I grew up in a time in the 60s and in the 70s, school-wise, where my teachers, and this is not getting on teachers, but at that point in that culture, it was, if you want to write, well, then you need to do journalism, you need to do magazines, you need to deal, in fact, comic books, eh, it's like, I want to be a rock star, that kind of thing. You can't make any money. There's no guarantee. There's less of a chance. I want to be a professional football player. You know, the, the odds are that. It was one of those things. And I think what, in that time period, what they were missing out on is the possibilities are endless. Possibilities truly are endless. And I think that 
stifled creativity. I, I don't think that happens now with technology, with, with, with so much. I mean, I'll give you an example. When I walk into a mall and I go and say J.C. Penney's and I see a T-shirt that says Spider-Man, I never thought my 14-year-old self would have had, would have exploded. Never thought that because no one knew who Spider-Man was then. Now everyone, whether they've read a comic book or not, knows who Spider-Man is. So the cultural change, technology, in my case, caught up with comic books. That's why you see all these Marvel and DC movies. They're so successful. The ones in the 70s were so terrible because we have an unlimited budget when we make stuff up in comics. Artists can draw anything. So... It, it's it's everyone's got a passion. Everyone does. Um, it's just a matter of mining that that question and getting that answer that uh, you need as a, a teacher, authoritative figure, a boss to help that person make that dream come true and that passion. And if you're out there and you've ever said that to anybody, don't or think about it and then come back to them and say, well, yeah, I, I do have a, a, a passion. I like to go collect frogs. Well, then, you know, you may need to be in a lab or out in the field doing study on frogs. I mean, there are, I'm just, that's top of, of my pointy weird head, but that's the kind of stuff you should never stifle yourself. Uh, David, if you can tell them in adult terms. Something. <laughs> um, I'm not certain if I have much to say. If you haven't found your passion yet, you need to go find it. Um, like quite honestly, go get some experiences. Um, maybe, you know, I've been blessed to have, um, family members have dragged me across the country back and forth. Uh, dad was in the military, got some cool experiences with that too. Um, I didn't go experience some stuff, go find your passion, go find a problem to solve. Um, be afraid to fail and go, go give it a shot. I would maybe look back to a lot of you are very young in here, but even go younger, um, it's kind of what Bo touched on. When I was growing up, and I've told this story before here, um, my dad was a pharmacist. Okay, so he's very scientific. He's very in the health field. That's what he lived and breathed, and he also enjoyed being a, a small business entrepreneur. But whenever I would say stuff like, um, I, I can honestly remember having multiple crying arguments with him. I wanted to be an art teacher. And when he said no to that, I said I wanted to be a hairstylist. He, he said no to that. Um, he said no to all the things that I loved, okay? And he pushed me into thinking that for me to be successful, I was going to have to do something that I would make a good living at. And, and when I was growing up in our area of Gallia County, um, it looked pretty pretty low the choices um, and I'm not saying anything against these professions I'm just saying so to me as with a parent saying no 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 um, you could work at our hospital you could work at that power plant I put on a t-shirt um, you could um, be a teacher um, and or maybe you could get a job working for the county so you would have good insurance and retirement. These were things that were pushed on me all the time. So what happened to me was I went to college three or four times throughout my life. I'm, um, I'm one semester away from a bachelor's degree right now at 43 years old. Um, I'm not saying I blame my father, but I can tell you that he clouded my judgment. He clouded what my, my passions were at that time. And it took me 40 years to walk out of this school with an associate's degree in graphic design. And here I am now, and my brother um, also sells plants and tomatoes and stuff like that, and we both love to tell our father how great we're doing, um, at doing things that we love to do, because he would have never supported it. Um, and I know, that, I know that in this area, I touched on the Appalachian region again, um, I'm very passionate about us being born into the world thinking we are below the rest of the country. Um, we are not. We have all that new technology that Bo was talking about. We have so many things at our fingertips. If you have an iPhone, you can make a documentary, okay? You can take pictures that are good enough to be in magazines. Um, they, there's so many things that are easily accessible now. Um, a girl that works at the plant store 
um, the Potted Edge, with it's in with my store. She just got an internship at a St. Louis uh, newspaper as a photographer. She's from Milton, West Virginia. Her family told her the same thing. You're never going to make money around here being a photojournalist. Well, she's going to St. Louis. She just put in her notice. So um, I just say dig real far down deep, find those little things you like, and then don't be afraid to work because if you, nothing's going to be handed to you. You still have to work for it. I have a few uh, brief questions, if I may, and I'd like to start with Alicia. Um, when you make a new shirt, does your catalog sort of build, like, and you have to keep reprinting shirts, or is it more of a limited run type of deal? Well, um, I have a few shirts that what I call are my classics. I don't know if you can be a classic at, at you know, a few years in, but I have a few shirts that sell repeatedly. Um, I have one that sells well both down here and at home. And why we've been up here, I just got a message that they uh, a big order just came in printed completely wrong. Um, so I have that's one of the things I struggle with with that inventory turnover I was talking about with you. I have shirts that people absolutely love. They're waiting for the next shipment to come in. And then I have shirts that take longer for me to convince people that they love them. Uh, so, um, yes, I am building what I call my, um, my go-tos. And I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the company, um, homage. Um, they are, they are two guys from, uh, went to Ohio University that have hit it pretty big in the state of Ohio, Pennsylvania. I think they've branched out into um, Indiana and Kentucky now. Um, they're a pretty big company, but if you check them out, they have several shirts that have been selling for years, um, and I love that. I hope to find a few shirts that really speak to our area that will really bring me to the level I want to be at. And then some of these other shirts, like feeling everything but sorry, that shirt could go well beyond here if, if I get to the point where I feel comfortable to market them online. Thank you. Um, David, um, I hear everyone in marketing say social media, social media, social media. Are there any examples that still exist outside of social media that are super effective to get your name and your message out there? Great question, and definitely yes. Uh, before I get to the non-social stuff, there's two very big sides to social, your organic and your paid approaches. Organic will get you very far, right? Just posting naturally, um, basically not using an ad budget to move your stuff around. But the, the big thing of it is, and this is why Mark Zuckerberg has so many yachts, um, Facebook is a pay-to-play marketplace. So if you have, let's say, a 1,000 followers on your Facebook page and you post something, gets a couple likes, maybe a share or two, you'll be lucky if that one post gets circulated to 10% of your following. So you're leaving 900 people on the table if you don't have a paid approach to what you're doing. That's the bulk of my business is actually helping people use social media in a way that unfortunately takes money, but you got to do it. Um, and what we help you do is we actually help you determine the ad budget and the targeting and everything else. And what we do, let's say T-shirts, 20 I'm going to make some assumptions here. 20 bucks, uh, let's say cost of goods on that's 10, but the ad budget behind it, let's say it maybe cost you $3 worth of ad budget to circulate around. Well, you still got a $7 margin right there. If you can live in that $7 margin, you can scale it to the moon. Um, that's exactly what we did for Blinko. So uh, we built a very aggressive digital marketing uh, and targeting, re retargeting <clears throat> uh, ad campaign for Blinko. And that, that's the big success there. Uh, email, email is absolutely massive email programs. Uh, a lot of people you know, are always asking for your emails and it turns into a spam a lot of times. But basically, uh, your email list is the best thing. It was the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, list growth and list um, acquisition services are a big part of what we do as well. But really and truly, um, your emails are going to be the best people they've opted into receiving your information. It's your engaged customer base. And also the best part of it is you don't have to pay Facebook or anybody else to actually reach those people. Uh, there's a lot of free email marketing services. MailChimp is an incredibly useful one. Uh, super, super duper handy. I know you, uh, Alicia mentioned using Square. They also have their inbuilt uh, email marketing system and stuff like that too. Uh, MailChimp is a really, really great one. It's free for up to 2,000 people. You can start using it today. Uh, start building your customer list that way. Um, also, there's off-site stuff too, off-site targeting for as far as the digital world goes. Um, people in this building right now have a tool called El Toro. They're actually based out of Louisville. I can geofence down to a three meter area and grab all of our mobile device IDs. The same thing, it's the unique ID that I can serve ads to you. It's how, you know, I say they're collecting anonymous data about you. What's well, your mobile device ID? 
and grab all of our mobile device IDs, traverse back to your home IP because home is where you spend most of your time connected to your Wi-Fi. I can figure out where your home is and then I can find anybody else who connects to your home. So if you people are interested in uh, entrepreneurship stuff, exactly, right. Exactly. Right. And so that stuff does pre what they call uh, pre-roll uh, videos and banners. So let's say you're on a news website on CNN and they hit you with a video beforehand. That off social targeting type stuff you can do. Uh, it's expensive, but it's incredibly effective uh, when you're trying to increase awareness for your brand and that kind of stuff, too. So lots of very cool things. And it's getting creepier every single day. Um, <laughs> Just, uh, you know, if you tell Google what you're, uh, like, as my business, Google Places listening, let's say you're looking for Infinity Marketing, you see on the sign, Infinity, my address, that kind of stuff. Mm. I can tell Google what my Wi-Fi name is, and if you show up and you have some sort of phone and it connects and it goes, oh, you're there, you're there at their location, let's review it, and they start hitting you with that kind of stuff, just based on your passive wireless signals. So there's, depending on how much time you have, I can talk about this stuff all day, I really like to, um, but there's a lot of stuff to do off social that is very crucial. If I could have one more really quick. Uh, Bo, uh, when it comes to the story, of, or when it comes to writing a story, do you start with a big idea and work your way up to it? Or is it more of like those big ideas come along based on smaller details that you're kind of... I can only go with, with what has always worked for me. I could be walking the dog, I could be in the shower. A piece of dialogue, not connected to any story will come, the story will build around that piece of dialogue. Um, a scene, I, I can remember, you know, I'll be in the uh, Jeep driving down the road, hear a song, and just hear a phrase, and that immediately just burst into a story. And then other times, I have, I have characters, I have stories that have sometimes set my drawer 10 years because it's not right yet, and when the time is right, I pull them out. I never, there's, I have filled up, and I'm still old school, uh, I, I write and final draft program on my computer, the scripts. But everything else I probably at the house, much to my wife's chagrin, I have three to four hundred little notebooks filled with ideas, dialogue, anything. I know where they are and I know where to go get them, but for me it's it's real scattershot like that, but it every I never every one of them's a gem to me and I never throw anything away. That's so, and it comes from anything. Sure. Well, thank you. Our time is up. Please make sure that oh, you've wait completed. Minute, wait minute, wait minute. Oh, we haven't. Okay. One more thing. Make sure the, you complete your surveys and leave them on the table as you leave. You know those cards surveys? I handed out? All right. Did anybody get, I'm the Joker card. Did anybody get, you've got one? Did anybody else get? Okay. All right. Prize. Did you get one too? Who got, who got, you got one? No, I got one with like. You got one. Yeah, pass it on. Yeah. Pass it on? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So there we go. I appreciate you all showing up. And, and so. <laughs>